All right, uh, this morning we'll have a, a prayer. You can turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. See how quickly we made the jump, Ezekiel? You'll see there's hope. We just went from Genesis to 1 Thessalonians. <laughs> We're going back to Genesis. <laughs> All right, maybe we can just have a word of prayer again. Our gracious God, um, our loving Heavenly Father, our Lord and our Savior, we do bow before you and enjoy being able to come into your presence. And uh, one day we will actually be in your presence as we're about to read. Um, and that is something we can't even fathom uh, how the, what that experience is going to be like. Um, it's going to be unlike anything we could have <coughs> ever imagined, um, even collectively, even if all of us collectively put the best of our imaginations together um, into one imagination. The reality of what's gonna happen when we are with you and in your presence is just, it's gonna be so beyond that. Uh, but by faith right now, uh, and that's how wonderful faith is, it brings us into your presence and we realize we're truly in the presence of the living God and that you are listening to us um, and faith will lay hold of that. And so, we rejoice to draw near to you this morning, and uh, we just ask for a blessing. This is our last uh, just uh, morning here, our last couple of sessions, just together until next year, really, uh, in your will. And we pray you'll grab a hold of our hearts and our minds and, and just tie everything together and just help us to um, just rejoice at the things that we're going to read and think about, help our imaginations to just put these pieces together and and just be excited about knowing what's to come and kind of being like prophets this morning as we look ahead and enjoy the rest of that story. We pray that everything will just uh, be, be clear to us and, and that uh, we'll enjoy seeing this beautiful picture that you purposely put in place so very many years ago, even through the lives of, of the patriarchs. So bless our time this morning, we pray. We love you. And Lord Jesus, we just ask these things in your name and for your name's sake. Amen. 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 Okay, one last time, here we are seeing the future uh, through history. And before we finish up our story uh, there in Genesis, it would just be good to go to this passage uh, to make sure we have this clear. And um, uh, actually, we'll head right away here and put up uh, this chart that you've uh, already seen. And uh, then we'll read this passage, First Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to Start at verse uh, 13, and uh, someone maybe want to read for us, verses 13 to, well, the chapter ends at verse 18, uh, so why don't we just go to 18, uh, really want to go to verse 17, but it's hard to not read 18 as well, <laughs> so someone read for us, First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve us with the rest who do not have hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are asleep, uh, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay. So God is here telling us the future through the Apostle Paul. He's telling us what's going to happen. And as we've already thought before, like it could have been very easy for God to not reveal this to us. But he has made it known to us that the day is coming when the Lord Jesus, where he is right now, he's, if we could just look with the eyes of faith and look into heaven right now, we would see him sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high, sitting at the right hand of God. He's sitting and the moment's going to come, the moment is going to come, and he's going to get up from that seat, 
and he is going to descend from heaven and there's going to be a shout and there's going to be a trumpet, the voice of an archangel. And when he comes, he's going to bring with him those who have died, uh, those who are in Christ. Um, their spirits are now with God. Their bodies are in the grave. Their spirits are with God. But when Jesus comes, he's bringing those spirits with him. It's termed those who sleep in Jesus. He's bringing them with him and they're going to return to their bodies their bodies are going to come out of the graves. Uh, their spirits are going to join their bodies. The bodies are going to come out of the graves. The dead in Christ will rise first. And then we're all going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. The Lord isn't coming all the way down. This is very important for our story when we go back to it. The Lord is not coming all the way down to the earth. There, he, one day he is going to come all the way down to the earth. And his feet are going to touch on the Mount of Olives. And it's an epic thing to think of Jesus. <laughs> putting his feet on the earth again. But this is not yet. He comes to the air and he catches us up to meet him there. And then he takes us back to heaven. He takes us back to the father. And there it is that he marries us for we are his bride and he's coming one day to get his bride. So he descends the dead in Christ rise first and we who are alive and remain shall be caught together with them, with those who have died. Their spirits have joined their bodies. It's a mysterious thing. How is that going to all happen? But God is able to do it. And all of us are going to join together and meet the Lord in the air. And thus, we will always be with the Lord. So this um, chart again, you know, we're just putting these pieces together. There's so many passages and it makes the picture more clearer. The more passages we read, the more we realize that this is a, this is a good depiction of, of the future. And so the prophets are looking ahead, and they don't see this whole section here. This is the church age. It began, and then it's going to have a completion. And as we sometimes say, the last person is going to get saved in the church age. Um, the church is described as a building, and each of us are living stones being put into the building. And then that last stone, if you will, is going to be placed in the building, and the building will be done. And uh, then the rapture, here it is right here, the rapture uh, takes place, and the church is completed and goes to be with the Lord. And then after that, after that, well, you have this picture here of the Antichrist. So that, just, just that image of him alone right there just tells you what's going to follow the rapture. How much time is going to pass between the rapture and the beginning of Daniel 70 and 7? Uh, is that right? Does he put that on there? Oh, we'll look at the other. I, don't know, I guess he doesn't have that on there. But um, it's just going to be, you read the book of Revelation after chapter 5. Uh, I remember it was actually right here. We were up here, um, upstairs. I was doing uh, lessons with the kids for camp during the summer. And I asked the kids what they wanted to do. And they all wanted to do Revelation, except for one girl. And she was asking, please don't do Revelation. Um, and I said, well, everybody wants to do it. We'll start it. If there is a problem, we'll stop. We'll do something else. So we got into Revelation. And we hadn't gotten very far at all because it's such an intense book. So many images that are just um, powerful and disturbing, maybe scary. <clears throat> We hadn't gotten that far into it. Look over, and this girl's like crying. It was just upstairs. We're, we're reading out upstairs. So I saw her. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. We'll do something else. <laughs> it was just too much for her, and for her sake, <clears throat> we weren't going to plow through it. But these days uh, are just absolutely. It's the day of the Lord. It's the day of wrath and judgment. It's the day when the whole world is worshiping uh, the beast, and there's an antichrist um, who's just. Just causing all kinds of havoc, but we are not here for that. We are gone for that. Uh, and then, if you look here, just a little evidence for that. In chapter five of the same book that we're in, he begins to talk about the day of the Lord. And there's 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 a lot of things we couldn't really talk too much about because we just don't have the time. But the day of the Lord is a day of wrath, a day of judgment, a day of clouds and darkness and gloom. It's a day when God is going to dis destroy the wicked. There's been other days of the Lord in the past. It's not a specific 24-hour period, but it's a period of time in which the Lord is just coming to, to just, uh, or he's dealing with man in judgment, and it's a scary thing. And that day is coming. But I want you to notice chapter 5 and uh, verse 8. 
He says, but let us who are of the day, that's the church, let us of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So he's telling them to put on the helmet of a hope of salvation. Now they're already saved. What salvation are they hoping for? They are having a confident, remember the, the idea of hope, a confident expectation that God is going to save them from the day of the Lord. He's going to save them from that wrath, and we will not see it. Verse 9 says, for God did not appoint us to wrath. In the context of this, it, the wrath is the day of the Lord. It's, it's, it's one of the Antichrist this year. It's the tribulation. He did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are, we're waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to come to deliver us from that wrath to come. If we have time at the end, I'm not going to do it now just because I know we need to finish. Uh, but if you want more evidence for why we will not be here for the tribulation, we can talk about that. But I'm going to kind of leave that at that point. We're looking for this morning star. We're looking for the morning star. Uh, and when we see that, uh, that's the Lord returning for us. And the morning star, even in our astronomy, we look out the night sky in the morning, the morning star appears right before the sun rises. And in between, we have the tribulation, but the Lord is going to come and he's going to be like, it's going to be like the sun shining. <laughs> the whole earth is going to be filled with light because Christ will be here. And that's different than this. This is like very faint. Um, this whole sky is dark and you see this one bright light and that's the coming of the Lord for the church. And he's going to take us um, to be with him. So we want to have that. He's not going to, he's not going to come down and we're not going to meet him. And then he's going to return in judgment. No, no, no. That's not the way it's going to be. He returns in judgment here. But when he comes here, he comes to the air. We meet him. We go somewhere in between. And then he takes us back. And then he will come later after the tribulation is over. And then there's, there's plenty of evidence to help support um, that. Um, oh, yeah. Take this picture here. I don't know. You can try and find... Pretty cool picture of uh, what's that? Can you ex explain just for, for reference how the rapture word does not exist there? Mm. What the concept? Sure. Uh, the um, the word where we get the word rapture is in verse seventeen of chapter four. Caught up, caught up. Um, so the word rapture is not in the Bible, as is often said when people talk about this. Neither is the word trinity. Uh, so, you know, there's Christian words that are legitimate words to help us understand things. Um, but the catching up, I mean, if you want to be really technical, instead of using the word rapture, you use the word catching up. So that's, that's that. Um, and this is, I don't know if this is what it's going to look like, <laughs> but, uh, just to all the people. And it, it, it almost looks like, could the, is this really going to happen? It's really going to happen, guys. We're, it's really going to happen. This is the word of God. Um, and it's really going to happen. Uh, I put this one up here again because I wanted to remind you, I guess I'm saying I, I'm not going to give a whole bunch of evidence. We can do that after if we have time. But uh, I wanted to at least go to this and remind you, here's the 77 of Daniel. And remember, uh, this is, I think this is great expression uh, to just help you remember uh, the way things are working. The church had nothing to do with the first 69 sevens. <clears throat> the church had nothing to do with the first 69 weeks. The church didn't even begin until after these were over. And the church is going to have nothing to do with the last one. That's the tribulation, the last seven, the last seven years. Here's the first 69 sevens. Here's the last seven. The church had nothing to do with these it started after it. It's going to be completed before this one begins. So this is a mystery. This is a hidden thing where God is finding a bride for his son. And when he completes that search, so to speak, and the bride is complete, she will be brought to him. And then he will resume his program with Israel. So this is, remember, remember the 70? What did it have to do with? It had to do with Daniel's people and Daniel's city. So this has everything to do with Israel. And you even heard last night, or was it the night before, just some of the guys on the video just mentioning how there are those who don't believe in a literal fulfillment of, of the promises to Israel. But we do. We do believe that, and that's going to take place here. But God is he's kind of gone out of relationship with Israel as a nation at this point. And this whole period of time, he's not in 
relationship with Israel. Not that Israelites can't get saved. Jews can't get saved. My brother-in-law is Jewish, but he's a Christian. He's a part of the church. But the nation as a whole, God is not dealing with them in relationship way at this time. He will again here. He was here, but uh, they put themselves in a position by rejecting the Messiah. Um, they put themselves in a position where in their disobedience and rebellion, they're out of relationship with God. But he is going to be faithful and he's going to restore them in a future day. Um, go back to this one here and just leave that up. Um, I want to say this because I'm, I'm saying these things, guys, and remind us of these things because when we get to our story, you're going to want to know these details because that way it will really strike you the way I think it's supposed to strike you. Um, it's, as, it's, it's as if Israel is dead. It's as if the wife of the father is dead. God was in a relationship with Israel, um, and now he is out of relationship with her. It's almost in a figurative way like she's dead. Uh, but just as, get, get this, this is really cool. Just as Abraham knew that if Isaac died, if he had to kill his son Isaac, that God would raise him from the dead because of his promises, because of his faithfulness uh, of, of working through Isaac, he knew that even if Isaac died, he would bring Isaac back to life again. The same thing is true about Israel. The same thing is true about Israel. If Israel is out of relationship with God, if Israel is like dead, she must come back to life because of his promises, because of his blessings that he is determined to bring through Israel. Even if he is out of relationship with her, he will bring her back. And the prophets talk about this. Sometimes he talks about her, how God divorced her, put her away because of her unfaithfulness. And, and we're going to about ready to watch a video uh, that just shows us that she's, she's put almost as if she's dead. She's going to be resurrected. She's going to be restored to a relationship with God. But this will not happen until the mystery of the church has finished. So I want you to go, guys to go now to Ezekiel 37. And I'm going to show you a little video. I was wondering if I could get a chance to do this because I really liked this video. But what's wild is that um, this video, <laughs> I mean, it's a cool video, but I, it's amazing where they stop the video. Uh, it's just going to be a quote from Ezekiel 37, but it's just, it's so wild where they stop the video. And you'll see, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just a curious thing. So let me turn the volume up here. Definitely cool, but I mean, it's just cool. 
<laughs> but like, what's the point? Like, okay, to what end is this, is this true? So that's why we're, gonna, we're here just to see what this video is all about. Go to verse 11. We're gonna pick up at the next verse after where they stopped reading the next verse, verse 11. And actually, I know, uh, <laughs> I do want to be careful with my time, but like, we just have to read till the end of the chapter. So let me get some people to read here. Um, just uh, maybe what I'll do is we're going to go to the end of the chapter. Someone just read a number of verses and stop, and then someone pick up after, okay? Um, maybe I'll just start, and someone get ready to just do a few verses after me. And then stop and someone else start reading. We'll go to the end of the chapter. We'll start at verse 11. Then it says, so picking up right from the video, then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Like you never get that from the video. Who are these bones? What is this? This is Israel, dead, if you will. They indeed say, so it's figurative, obviously, if they're they're not literally dead. It's a figurative death here of, of the nation of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry. Our hope is lost. And we ourselves are cut off. So Israel thinks that they're completely forgotten, abandoned, dead. There's no hope for them. There's no future for them. They're done with. God is done with them. Um, verse 12, therefore prophesy and, and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, all my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you. My spirit in you. I get, I, I, I'm going to be in so much trouble if I do this, but um, the word spirit here is the same word for breath. Um, and you, this whole section here, going back, starting at, in chapter 36, this whole section here, the word spirit, the word breath is used a curious number of times. Anyone want to guess how many times he's saying to Israel, I'm going to put my spirit in you. Any guesses how many times the word spirit might be used if he's speaking to Israel? Seven. Nope. Twelve. Twelve. I mean, that's just not coincidence. There's no way that's coincidence. There's 12 tribes of Israel and God is speaking to Israel saying, I'm going to put my spirit in you. Is that me saying I'm going to put my spirit in every one of you tribes? You are going to be revived. You are going to come to life again. Um, That's in the whole Old Testament, 12 times? Or just no, no, just in this passage. passage. Just in this passage. Right. Yeah. Um, you know what? I'm going to, we have to move on. So I'm going to let you guys read the rest of that on your own, 15 to the end of the chapter. But it just makes the point so clear that God has got a, a plan and a future for Israel, and uh, they're going to be in their land, they're going to be flourishing in their land, God's going to be glorify them in their land, and that is still yet future. Um, in fact, uh, let's go back to, oh, wait, let me see, what am I doing? This, um, this guy, I got to read this quote, this guy uh, named John Nelson Darby, he went through a whole bunch of passages. I don't, I don't even know what passages he picked. I mean, I have a whole bunch of them for myself. He, and I'm sure that we used a lot of the same ones. And he went through them in some discourse in some place, one after another, after another from the Old Testament, one passage, one passage. And then he said this, I've gone through these prophecies that the reader may clearly see that the doctrine of a Jewish remnant, a remnant, pious and waiting on Jehovah, before his appearing to deliver them and whose piety and confidence are owned by him is not a matter of speculation or of the interpretation of some difficult or obscure text, but the clear, consistent, impressive and prominent testimony of the spirit of God. He's like, you guys, this is not like some obscure thought. This is in the prophets again and again and again and again. And it's absolutely certain that it's going to happen. Israel's going to be restored and uh, the Lord is going to bring them into the land and bless them. He will be back in relationship with Israel again, even though right now he is not. So now with that in mind, we are ready to go back to our story. So uh, go back to Genesis chapter 22. And as we do that, any question or any thought before we get back into the story and try and finish this before lunch? <laughs> Genesis 22, any thought or question? I'll leave that up 
there just so you know. Okay, guys, um, here we go then. This is gonna be cool. So verse 19, we're gonna we're up to. Uh, that's a little summary here. The beloved son uh, was on the scene. He was written about. We've heard his words. Uh, Isaac, we've heard him speak. He was part of the scene that was going on. The father, Abraham, has offered that beloved son on the altar. He has received him back from the dead, right, in a figurative sense. Um, and here we find something very, very interesting, the way the Holy Spirit writes it. Look at verse 19. It says, so Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. What do you, what's missing there? What's missing? Curious thing that's missing. Isaac. Isaac. <laughs> Where's Isaac? Did he leave him on the mountain? It just says Abraham came down. I'm telling you guys, this is purposeful. This is purposeful. We know Isaac came down the mountain, but the way the Holy Spirit wrote it is that Abraham came down the mountain. Isaac is no longer on the scene. The beloved son who was offered up on the altar, who rose from the dead, is not on the scene anymore. Now, does that sound prophetic? <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, it, sound, it sounds like the way it is right now. Christ has come. He made the offering. And after he made the offering, he has gone to heaven. He's not on the scene here. And we just see a little hint at that by the Holy Spirit having Moses write that Abraham came down the mountain and, and doesn't talk about Isaac. In fact, Isaac is going to be off the scene here until a very peculiar point in the story. You guys, this is so very cool. Isaac, the son, the beloved son who was offered, he's off the scene now. He's disappeared from our story. And he's going to turn up in the most curious, wonderful place. But let's keep going. Verse 20 to 24. Someone read that for us, if anyone that feels like uh, trying to pronounce some names. There will be one name in here in particular that you should recognize. There's going to be a lot of names you won't recognize, but there should be one name that you ought to be familiar with, uh, probably because uh, people are uh, name their children with this name even today, so it's not an unfamiliar one. I don't know too many hazels, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> someone want to read 20 to 24? But now it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Indeed, Milcah also has born children to your brother Nahor, Puz his firstborn, Buzz his brother, Chemiel, the father of Aram, she said, Hazo, Pildash, Jibla, and Bethiel, and Bethuel begot Rebekah. These eight Milcah bought, bore to Nabor, Abram's brother, uh, his concubine, whose name was Rima, also bore Teba, Gaham, Tahash, and Makab. <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> <Yeah. laughs> nice try. I mean, that was like pretty good. So, of all those names in there, which one would you maybe recognize? Rebecca. Rebecca. So who's Rebecca going to be? Isaac's wife. Who's the wife of the son who was offered up, the beloved son who was offered up as a sacrifice? Who's the wife of the son? Besides Rebecca, oh my, I'm talking now about Christ. Who is the wife? The church. So guys, right now we have the introduction of this name, the bride of the son, and it's after the sacrifice. After the sacrifice, here we have the, the idea given to us of the church, the bride of Christ. So this is very interesting how this is developing here, um, and the church is spoken of after Isaac has left the scene. That fits what took place. Uh, Jesus ascended, and then Pentecost came, the church began, the bride of Christ comes into existence. So now we're into chapter 23, and uh, someone want to read for us verses 1 and 2? Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. So Sarah died in Kirchah, Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Haiti, and Abraham came to mourn. For Sarah to wait for her. Okay. So Sarah dies. 
Sarah is the wife of Abraham. Sarah is the one who brought the beloved son into the world. Um, she is the one who bore, who was pregnant with Isaac and gave him birth and brought him into the world. So when we think of the beloved son and Isaac, we see, we see Sarah as his mother. When we think of Christ as the beloved son, who brought Christ into the world? Now we say, yes, Mary, but Israel. Israel brought the beloved son into the world, just as Rebecca represents the church, Sarah represents Israel. And so wouldn't you know it that when a, what we're embarking on here is a bride is going to be sought for the son. Isaac is not on the scene. Jesus is not on the scene. And the whole time, while he's not on the scene, a bride is being sought out for him. But yet Israel is out of relationship with them. The one that Israel was in relationship with has died. How curious the timing of it all. Abraham is married. Then she dies. Israel dies and no longer in relationship with God. And the whole time that a bride is being sought out for the son, God is not in relationship with Israel. And Abraham is not in relationship because Sarah has died. Um, go to chapter 24. Chapter 24. Somebody read verses 1 to 4 for us. Now Abraham was old, advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had. Please place your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth. And you shall not take a wife for my sons and the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live. But you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son, Isaac. Okay, <clears throat> here is the main story now. This is, what, <clears throat> this is what everything is all about now at this point in time is it's all about finding a bride for the son, the beloved son, the one who was offered as a sacrifice, the one who rose from the dead, the one who is not on the scene anymore. It's time. The whole story is about finding a bride for him. And that's what's going to happen here from this point on until a very curious point. I mean, it's just so cool the way these things just fit together. It is a bit more mysterious. When we were going through Abraham and Isaac and Isaac's the, the, um, the beloved son being placed on the altar. I mean, we are finding like details like crazy that matched. When you get to this, it's a bit more mysterious. It's not so, you don't have all of these details like so clearly connecting things like we did back in chapter 22. But that seems to fit too, because the church is a mystery. It just, it's not known in the Old Testament. It's just this it's like you see the prophet, he's looking right over it. He has no idea about this gap. He has no idea that there's a church, a whole entity that God is, is working. They're not looking at this story and saying, oh, um, a bride is being sought for the son. They, I mean, they're not, there's no way they're seeing that. This is a mystery that's hidden. Now that we have the New Testament, things have been revealed to us. We go back and we see it, but they didn't see it. But that's what the whole story is about about a bride that's being sought out for the son. Um, let me just pause here for a minute uh, before we go on in the story. Any thoughts just so far about this? As we get ready, the servant is gonna begin his journey and he's gonna go find, and it's a fun story to just read. Uh, and the way it ends is pretty spectacular, but any thoughts just so far on this? Yeah, I don't Richard. know if everybody's got it clear, but that straight line of Abraham looking through from the beginning from his eye to the very end. Maybe you could point that out again. I don't know if you did. Yeah, uh, it's not just Abraham, it's the prophets. And uh, when they're writing their books, they're writing Ezekiel's writing, Hosea's writing, Micah's writing. As they write, they see things. And they write about things, but then there's things that they do not see. They are not aware of. And so to them, like, it's just a hidden thing. The church is a hidden thing. And they also don't realize these mountain peaks and these mountain peaks have a whole gap in between. They could see this all together. And remember, we talked about this. It was, it was such a, 
uh, a mysterious thing to the prophets as they looked, they, they saw the suffering of the Messiah, they saw the glory of the Messiah. They saw the death of the Messiah. They saw the honor of, and the power and kingdom. And they just, how did they put those pieces together? They're seeing all that stuff. And it seems like it's all happening at the same time. But they didn't realize that the first coming of the, of the Messiah would be to die. And the second coming of the Messiah would be to reign. And so all the things that they are prophesying about, they're all going to come true. But they're not all going to come true at the same time. And in between, there's this big gap in which we are living right now. Does that make sense, Rich? The world that way. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, I can read Isaiah and uh, mm -hmm. uh, chapter 66, verse 7. I think he talks about uh, how the Messiah will come out from Israel. It says, Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her being king, she gave birth to a boy. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah, that awesome. But it is. It's in reverse. It's the Lord's reversal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Israel in Revelation, you see a woman clothed with the sun and stars around her head, and she's the one who gives birth to this um, ruler, the one who's going to rule the nations. And you say, who is this woman? And then the dragon comes and starts persecuting the woman. And the Lord delivers the woman uh, and protects the woman. Well, who is the woman? The woman is Israel. She's the one that gave birth to the Messiah. And so she's looked at as a woman in the book of Revelation. And then she does the tribulation. Yeah, yeah. And then after that. Yeah. There's, you guys, like, uh, Israel, yeah, what they're going to go through Zechariah says two thirds of Israel is going to be cut off and die. Two thirds of Israel is going to cut, be cut off and die. They're going to. I mean, you, you think how bad the Holocaust was. What's coming for Israel? And as someone said here, the time of Jacob's trouble. Remember, Jacob, his name was changed to Israel. So sometimes the nation of Israel is spoken of as Jacob. The There's time of Jacob's trouble. Two-thirds. Yeah, so there's, it, 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 but then the one-third is going to turn to God, and they're going to be righteous, and they're going to seek his redemption and seek salvation and seek forgiveness, and, and they're going to be humble and pious, and the Lord is going to save them. He's going to come, and he's going to protect them and deliver them and uh, save them. But I think at that time, again, uh, they, may, they might not know at, at that time that Jesus is their brother, that Jesus is the Messiah, but they will turn to God, the, to Yahweh. And then at some point they will understand, oh my goodness, Jesus is our Messiah. And they will believe on him and they will look upon him whom they pierced and they will mourn. But what dramatic events are coming, but Israel is going to go through so much, but here's, God is going to allow them to go through so much because there's this one phrase and it might work for you just as it will work for Israel. It says, in their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. And guys, God knows that that works. He might bring you through the most intense difficulties of your life because he knows that in bringing you into those things, you will seek him. And that is so good for us to seek him because then we find him. And uh, that's just a joy. So he might have to bring in the most intense circumstances of our life to stir us up to that, but it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. That whatever pain we have to go through, if it causes us to seek the Lord, we're blessed. And God wants to bless Israel, so he's going to bring them into the most severe affliction so that they turn and seek him. But it's amazing that even when he does that, some won't turn. You look at the book of Revelation, God's pouring out wrath from heaven. The most intense things and earthquakes and the blood, the moon turning to blood, stars falling from heaven, earthquake like no one's ever seen before. Everything in the sea dies. The third of the earth is burned up. The rivers turn to blood like hailstones so big. They're just destroying people and all of this and people in this affliction, they should turn to God and humble themselves before God. And many do. But so many still don't. So many still like shake their fist at God and curse him and blaspheme him, even in the midst of such affliction. So be careful how you 
respond to affliction in your life because not everybody responds well. Israel did not respond well. He kept doing things to them. He's like, I did this to you, but you haven't returned to me. Then I did this to you, but you haven't returned to me. Then I did this to you and you haven't returned to me. And eventually it's like, that's it. I'm going to bring my wrath. I have tried so much. I rise up early every morning. I send my prophets to you. Please come back to me. Please come back to me. But they just wouldn't. And eventually um, the, the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, the destruction of many, many, many Jews. Uh, God's wrath came. The day of the Lord came. And it's going to come again. And people are going to, they're still going to rebel against him. You know? Did you cover Zechariah 12? Uh two uh, and plans all the way to the end of the chapter and chapter four. <laughs> if we have another section a session, Rich, we might be able to do it. <laughs> no, what I mean is that I've I've had to I've had to leave a lot of stuff behind just to like try and finish our story. So if we have time, if we go back to that, I have a whole section in my notes that says if we have time, <laughs> go back. To that. So but let's go on. Let's go on to verses uh, five to nine. Someone want to read that? Um, Genesis 24, five to nine. I want you to notice one thing in particular as we read this. Um, something about the bride. It's a pretty cool detail. She, something she has to be. Something she has to be. Um, so someone read verses five to nine. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife from for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of life. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Okay. So the servant's going to go out. He's going to try and find a bride. He's going to go back to where Abraham came from. What is it that um, the bride must be in this passage? Willing. 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 You know, she must be willing to go. And each one of us, we were willing to trust the Savior, our own free will. We trusted the Savior. We responded to God's very gracious, <laughs> very kind, generous measures to which he worked in our lives and spoke to us and moved us. But we were willing and we trusted in him. And we are, we want to be the bride. We're willing to go to be with him. Um, and we decided that because of our, our free will. Um, we wouldn't have sought God if he hadn't sought for us. If he hadn't been gracious to us and kind and merciful, there would have been no hope for us. But because he does seek out and work in the lives of people, everyone has an opportunity to respond to him and be willing to be able to become a part of the bride. Now, I'm not saying that's part of our gospel message. You know, we can say are you willing to become a part of the bride? <laughs> I mean, we could say that, but mostly we talk about the need for forgiveness and, and uh, um, uh, yeah, of salvation. But part of it is that when we get saved, we become part of the bride. We're willing to become a part of the bride. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, the willingness uh, also, uh, what precedes the willingness is the hearing and believing of the testimony. Mm -hmm. And we likewise in the gospel today is hearing the testimony and the testimony being given so that the bride will believe. That yeah. So that yeah. It's in that order. Faith comes, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we have to hear the message first and then we can believe it. Yeah. Because some people just, the, the evangelist is, well, oh, come, 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 so they can have their numbers. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, so no good. They have to really believe the truth. Yeah. All right, let's keep going with it. And maybe after this section, we'll take our break. Uh, verses 10 to 14. Someone want to read for us verses 10 to 14? And the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed. 
for all his master's goods were in his hand. And he arose and, and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. Then he said, O Lord God of the master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, here I stand by the well of water and the waters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher and, I, and that I may drink. And she says, drink, and I will give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac, and I by this, and by this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Okay. Just in any any thoughts uh, you guys have on this little section, even just the thoughts about the storyline here. Um, you want to go deep, go deep, but also just anything that you see there in the storyline that's of interest to you. The guys that for some woman. She drew a lot of water for all She sure did. <laughs> yeah. I look out for one like that. <laughs> Take my advice, of course. <laughs> the, uh, I don't know, analogy of the church drawing from his word and being fed of his word. The woman, the bride, pulling water out. Mm. Mary being at the feet of Jesus, drawing of the water. A consecrated church, a church that is seeking after him. Yeah, it is interesting. That whole thing kind of hinges on the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that's where everything's happening is, is around the water, the giving and the taking of water. Yeah. Holy Spirit. So if you want to find a wife on the other river. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else has anything you want to point out about this part of the story? It is interesting that the word appointed is used. Uh, he says uh, right in uh, verse 14, um, let her be the one you have appointed for your servant, Isaac. And by this, I will know you have shown kindness to my master. It does seem to indicate foreknowledge, right? Uh, by God, God appointing her. Um, and God does foreknow. He can't help but foreknow, right? He's omniscient. He's omniscient. He's God. He, he can't help but just know everything. So he knows who the bride is going to be. Um, that doesn't mean he... Uh, it doesn't mean that it's not open to anyone to believe and become a part of the bride, but he just can't help but see the future. He knows who the bride is and he has appointed the bride. Whoever will trust in Christ becomes a part of the bride. And he's appointed her to be the wife of, of his son. It's neat to think that the Lord knew you. You know, he knew you. He knew that he could see through time and he could see that you would trust in him. And he knew that you would be part of the bride. Um, it's just neat to think that he, you know, he knew that. He knew that way ahead of time. All right. Well, uh, we'll see what happens here when we come back. Let's come back at 1115. 1115.